Greetings. I trust you had a good Easter. Uh, it's been good in the Midwest. It's a beautiful day on the outside. Uh, over the past weeks, we have had a constant stream of first-time visitors, and several have made second and third visits. One of our young lady attendees stuck around long enough a few days back to express her desire for a home Bible study. Uh, I've also been blessed to have had interactions over the past few days with uh, church planners and pastors from the Philippines to New England all the way over into into Europe. And I'm encouraged by all this happening in the body of Christ. Truly good things are taking place. Now today's going to be a little bit different in the context of uh, the webinars that I do because I'm going to be a little bit philosophical. My idea is to get you thinking why you do even as you think about what you do and how you do it. Uh, those of you who are parents, your kids will on occasion say, why? Our grandsons, who are now 10 years old, pretty often will say to their parents and, and to us, why? Why? Well, that word's very annoying, particularly if it's repeated over and over again. And it's even more annoying if you don't have a good explanation as to why. So before we get very far into what I'm going to try to share with you, let me just drop this in. You need to know why, and you need to be able to communicate why in regard to virtually all that you do as a Christian leader and the things that you're challenging people, the behaviors you're challenging them in, in their Christian life. Hello, I'm Carlton Kuhn. My wife and I pastor Calvary. It's a United Pentecostal church here in Springfield, Missouri. And we've been involved in growing three churches, primarily through converts and through disciple making. I was blessed to see quite a bit on, uh, on the creative side, I guess would be the way to put it, in the years that I was the leader of North American Missions which was involved in helping with the planting of churches across our continent. So our time together, I'm going to try to accomplish several things. Number one, I truly want you to be effective in your work for the Lord, not just uh, new converts, but every aspect of our work should have us at some point asking the question, why? Actually, that question, why, is a key question for those who are lifelong learners. Secondly, I want to attempt to describe the significance of why. And third, I want to share an opportunity for you to explore for yourself some of the how and why material that I've developed through the years that can help you perhaps in thinking through how to better help your people mature in Christ. And then the last thing is I will respond to your questions. Um, you can post questions. This is a little bit different. We're having to do a rebuild from a breakdown tech, technically. And uh, if any of this raises a question for you, if you will email me at carltoncoonsenior at gmail.com, I will be glad to respond to your question. You can also in the comments below or in a message to me, you can post your, your questions and I will do my best. I like the ones that are posted publicly because many people then are going to be benefit from the answer because a lot of us have the same question. My personal email address is carltoncoonsenior.com. That's carltoncoon, C-O-O-N-S-R.com. Um, and uh, there's a link that we would provide for a special that we have in regard to some of the material that we're working on. Why is more important than what? Why is more important than how? Chuck Swindoll, I think it was, told the story of a lady who would buy a roast and would cut one end off the roast before she cooked it. She'd done it for years exactly as she had seen her mother do before her. Um, one of her kids eventually asked her why she cut and discarded what seemed to the child to be a perfectly normal piece of meat. 
Mom didn't know, and so she asked her mother, who was now up in years, and her mom laughed and said, I cut the end off the roast when you were a kid so it would fit in the only roasting pan I had. For a full generation, that younger lady, now a mother herself, had been doing something that she had seen somebody else do without giving any consideration to why. As a matter of fact, there was no good reason, not for her, to do it in the particular way that she continued to do it. I think it was John Wesley, whose ministerial students took to wearing a hat inside the church because John Wesley always wore one. When time had passed and this was kind of entrenched of his students, uh, somebody had the boldness to ask him, well now, uh, pastor or evangelist Wesley, uh, what is your theological position? Where do you get this idea about men wearing hats in church. And Wesley said, theological position. I wear a hat because there are pigeons in the church belfry and because my head gets cold. Why? It's good to ask why. It's good to ask why early rather than later. It matters on a whole lot of different fun. Fronts. So why you do a thing is more important than how you do it. It's more important than what you do. Jimmy Tony, who is our current director of North American Missions, introduced me to a TED Talk video named Golden Circles. It deals with a principle that I've been writing about and talking about to some degree for many years, that being able to tell someone what you're doing is good Showing someone how to do it is even more valuable. But being able to tell somebody why a thing is to be done and why you have chosen to do it in your particular way, that is vital. And the presenter of uh, that particular TED Talk said that you have these three golden circles. The inner circle is the concept of why, that if you can get hold of why, Something is important. Something needs to be done. If you can get hold of that, then in the process of time, what you do is going to build out, and you're going to get better at how you're accomplishing it. So what you do may change. How you go about doing it may change. But why a thing is to be done, that is highly unlikely to change. Considering your why keeps you focused. It keeps you from wasting time. It keeps you from wearing a hat to church when there are no pigeons in the attic. And it keeps you from cutting off a perfectly good part of the roast and throwing it away. We talk about something that is a what, how, and why aspect of the work that we have done. And this is simply an example I'm not as interested in you taking hold of all of my example and understanding it, although I guess that has merit and value, as I am to get you to thinking about your, your why, to get you thinking about the particular behaviors that you apply and you do so often perhaps without thought. Now, one of the things that we've used in the past, and we're steadily moving toward this being a reality again, in our current pastoral situation is the idea of an altar counselor. Now, an altar counselor is someone who meets immediately with a person who has been baptized, and this person spends some time with them just talking with them about the church. We don't let them wait until... Uh, a week later, we don't let them wait till midweek. We don't try to schedule something from Sunday to Monday. They come out of the baptistry. At best, there is an altar counselor who says, Hi, I'm Carlton. Uh, I, I would love to spend some time with you. I'm one of our altar counselors at the church. I want to get better acquainted. After you've dried off, uh, give me a few minutes and uh, let's meet in an office or let's meet somewhere to just discuss some things that I think you will find of benefit. So what we do is have this trained altar counselor meet with these folks 
We, of course, connect them on the basis of gender. We try to match ages and family situations. And they're meeting very quickly at the point of this experience with God. Okay, so we have the what. Now we have how. And the how is the nuts and bolts of the altar counselor's work. And if you listen in on the script, and obviously you're just going to hear one side of the script because I don't have anybody off camera that I'm sharing this with, but just imagine that you are the person who has been baptized tonight and that uh, I am talking with you, I'm visiting with you about your experience with God. Hi, I'm Carlton Coon. Our pastor asked me to visit with you in hopes of getting better acquainted. Here's a business card. It has my information. It has the church information, the pastor's phone number, and the church schedule. Um, I hope that you will put that in your phone or in your computer or just carry the card with you because we want you to know that you have access to us. Now, before we're through, I hope to be able to get the same information from you as far as your phone number, your email address, etc. Now, now, let me see. You received the Holy Ghost tonight, didn't you? You were baptized. Is that correct? Um, wow. What an exciting night. Welcome to Calvary. I, I've been part of our church here now for a bit over two years. I've seen some growth, and I've seen several new people just like you come into the church. It is an exciting thing to see people come into what is a growing, vibrant church. So I welcome you. I'm glad you're here. Now, let, let me mention to you that on the last Sunday of this quarter, pastor is going to be welcoming you and other newcomers to Calvary. And during that service, we're going to celebrate what happened for you tonight, and you'll receive a certificate that will, uh, that will always commemorate and celebrate your baptism in Jesus' name, and God filling you with the Holy Ghost. I rejoice with you and I'm thankful for what God is doing in your life. Now, let me ask this. Have you been part of or heard about our What the Bible Says Home Bible Study? Uh, what the Bible Says is seven lessons, and it deals topically with the Bible, what the Bible says about the Word of God, what the Bible says about salvation, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost, and several other topics. We can have this in a, in a coffee shop, a restaurant, or even in the pastor's office. We've got several very capable teachers who have been trained. And uh, if you're interested, I would like to make note of that before we get through here tonight. Let me tell you a little bit about Calvary. One of the things that is our strength, as a matter of fact, it is probably our dominant strength, is that we are strong in teaching and we're making progress in our disciple-making effort. And uh, we're all to be disciples. We're to be learners. In a few days, Pam Eddings, who is our director of discipleship, will be in contact, and she's going to let you know then about our next Take Root class. We really want you to be part of that class. In that class, you're going to learn about some of the incredible privileges that come to you because you have been saved. Now, let me get this information from you. And I began to work with this person to fill out the form, gathering together their information. If it's okay with you, our pastor would love to communicate with you periodically via email and text message. Can he use this email address? And, of course, we're hoping that they're positive. Now, let me ask, do you have any questions about your experience tonight? Do you have any questions for me about Calvary? One of the things that we really try to focus on is being welcoming and open. And if you have a question about anything, you have our numbers, mine, pastors, etc., Pam's, and you are welcome to call any of us. I do have some gifts for you. The pastor wrote a book about the first 10 days of new life. This is our gift to you. It's an easy read. I've also got this packet of material about the church. It talks about our schedule, our ministries, the discipleship program. I'm glad you're here, and I look forward to us becoming friends. My number's right here on this card. I want you to feel free to phone me about any question that you may have about our church. 
I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, would you mind us ending this with a time of prayer? And then that prayer is, is, is conversation. Now, obviously, this has been a one-sided conversation. It's a monologue. In the office, it would be a dialogue. And the counseling session is going to take quite a bit longer. And it can end up that the people in the room are excited or they may have questions. And you can do quite a bit of chasing rabbits. And, uh, but it's important. It's important to chase those particular rabbits and take that time. But I want to go beyond that. I want to talk about why. Nothing in the sequence of events is without thought or intent. The effectiveness of how is dependent on us having trained the altar counselor, given them the right tools, and then the commitment of this particular person to be effective as an altar counselor. Now, if they're wishing they were at Taco Bell with uh, a group of their peers, then they're not going to be very good at this. But if they can be someone who is truly committed to the, to the disciple-making process and the significance of this, then the altar counselor is going to make such a positive impact on your new believer that uh, it's going to be a wonderful thing. And uh, then I want to I take it beyond that. Why, why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? Um, now, there's two reasons that we have the altar counselors. The first is, is immediately on the point of baptism and conversion. The person who has been converted begins to have what I call buyer's remorse. They come out of the baptistry, their hair's a mess. They immediately begin to think about, well, this was a foolish thing I've just done. What have I done? This is, wow, I can't believe this. And so, and of course, the, the devil and their own flesh just are, are, they're in duet speaking against this positive thing of receiving the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. It's happening immediately as they're walking away from the baptistry. It's already begun that these voices are speaking to them from the wrong direction. The second reason that we would do altar counseling is because that uh, tomorrow this person is going to share their new experience. It's going to be like a man that came to our church just a few months ago, received the Holy Ghost, and he called a friend uh, later that very day to tell his friend about his experience. And I mean, she went off on him about there being no such thing and no availability of the very experience that he had just had. Didn't give him a chance to explain, not one bit, and hung up on him. Well, uh, that very morning, after his encounter with God, I had explained to him some of what was going to transpire, and, and I had no foreknowledge, and I had no word of prophecy guiding me. But those two things, the negative buyer's remorse and the negative peer pressure that they're going to get from family members and old friends who have been irreligious, Family members who hadn't been to church in 10 years are suddenly going to argue theology. So what you're doing is you're giving them another personal, positive encounter before they walk away from the church. Okay, so we have a why for the concept. If you'll apply the concept, it'll make a difference. Now, let's talk about why we do it, how we do it. Okay, so let me track you through this little script and uh, you, you, maybe I can help you to explain the why. And you can change some of what's said for yourself. But you've, there, there are things in here that have got to be accomplished at the why level. Okay? And so that's the baseline. That's that inner circle. Okay, hi, I'm Carlton. Our pastor asked me to visit with you. Okay, a couple of things are happening here. First of all, I'm going to use my first name. I'm not Brother Carlton. I'm not Brother Coon. I'm going to take down as many barriers as I can. I want him to be Joe, and I'm going to be Carlton. And so I'm going to make it as personal as possible. Now, if that's not comfortable for you, then do what you have to do to make it work. Uh, 
The second thing is that the script, if you noticed, is going to pretty often talk about the pastor. It's going to bring him into play. Well, why is this? The pastor is the shepherd of this flock. There's no hero worship here. But we begin conveying to this new person the significance of having a pastor in their life. Okay, so now we're saying, here's a business card with my information, the church information, the pastor's phone number, and the church schedule. Why? We give them personal information in hopes of getting equitable personal information back. Don't ask people for information from them if you're not willing to give information to them. Okay? So, uh, as a pastor, let me just toss this in. Every person in our church, I suppose, has my cell phone number. If we had 120 people, it might be a different situation. But cell phone is the means of my communication, uh, text messaging, and other things. Do calls occasionally come at 3 in the morning? Uh, sure. But that's just part of the job description. That goes with, with pastoring. Sheep have access to the shepherd. Okay, so now the question comes, can I get some information from you? Okay, we've just given them information. And we're asking them now to complete a form about their life, their address, their email address, their phone number. Can we text you? Can we connect with you on Facebook? Can we connect with you on Twitter? And we've already created that comfort zone. Okay, now back to the conversation. Let's see. You received the Holy Ghost and you were baptized tonight. Is that correct? On the last Sunday of this quarter, we're going to be welcoming you and other newcomers to Calvary. You're going to receive a certificate celebrating this great event. Why? This person's church participation in the church is just beginning. And an upcoming event is already scheduled to celebrate this historic event for them and others like them. And so all the way, all the while, we're seeding in the thought and we're helping this person envision their life as a part of the church family. Okay, have you been part of or have you heard about our What the Bible Says Bible study? Would you be interested? Why? We want this person to go through a home Bible study. Let me tell you about Calvary. We have a strong teaching and disciple-making effort Pam Eddings, our director of discipleship, is going to be in touch to let you know about our discipleship classes. You'll want to be part of the class. And why are we doing this? Because this is another piece of Velcro attaching them to interesting and meaningful things that will happen as we go forward. We're reaching to give these people points of interest. And just like Velcro is not, uh, that's a great it's a great concept. It's also a great idea to think about in the way that we deal with people, both as visitors and also new converts. One little tentacle of that Velcro is not going to do much to hold something that is of any significance. But you get all of those little tentacles working together, and suddenly you got something that you got to work to, to pull it apart. That's what you're wanting to do, and that's part of this process is you're attempting to Velcro people in. If it's okay with you, the pastor wants to communicate with you periodically via email and text message. Can he use this email address? Why would we ask that? Because asking permission is a positive thing. Now, if you ask permission and you get a negative, you have to be sure that you don't text that person or that you don't use any form of communication that they're not uh, that they've not approved you doing. Uh, so now, back to the script. Do you have any questions about me concerning your experience tonight? Uh, we want you to be comfortable. We want you to have questions. If somebody gives you a Bible question that you don't know the answer to, please, please call me or call the pastor. You have our numbers. Why are we doing that? Communication. Communication is not me talking to you Communications coming with the questions that you're sending back my direction or the amens or the affirmations. It's a two-way street. It's not a monologue. And so what we're trying to do, and it may even be that in some counseling ses sessions, 
that the counselor shares their testimony of how they came to be at Calvary. Okay, I do have some gifts for you. Our pastor wrote a book about the first 10 days of a new life. This is our gift to you. It's an easy read. I've also got a packet of material, a CD that's a guide for prayer and Bible reading. It's very simple. Pastor put it together a while back. There's some other material that talks about our schedule, the ministries of the church, and the discipleship program. Now, why would you do that? You're arming that person with resources. Will they use everything that you provide? No. Not in all likelihood. Some ends up discarded. Some ends up on used bookshelves, used bookstore bookshelves. Uh, but in another sense, quite often the items that I'm talking about are layabout pieces. That was the term that I used for my director's communique while I was the director of North American Missions. It might come in, it might lay there for a week or two weeks or sometimes five or six weeks because that's the way my own mail-to-be-read uh, stack can go at times. But eventually, it gets read. It lays about until it gets read. And uh, so we're giving them some things to read. We're giving them some things to listen to, some beginning tools for prayer and Bible reading, information that directs them to the church website. Why? 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 Because again, we're, 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 you're important to us. Every baby that leaves the hospital leaves with somebody carrying armloads of stuff to support this new birth, to support this new human that has come on planet Earth. It costs money to put this stuff in their hands, but in the long run, the investment is worth it. I'm glad you're here. I look forward to becoming friends. You have my number. Feel free to phone me about any question you have. And then prayer. Prayer is conversational. Reaching out, taking the person's hand, not putting your hand on their head, but taking their hand. And uh, you, pray, you pray about their life. You pray about their wife's sickness. You pray about their son who's struggling in school. You pray about their estranged teenager. You pray about their life, and then you pray about their journey, and God, Joe is here today, and he received the Holy Ghost, and God, you have such a plan for his life. I can't wait to see what Joe becomes in his Christian maturity. Lord, this man can be a nursery worker. This man can be a bus route attendant. This man can be a bus driver. He can be a preacher of the gospel. He can be a Sunday school teacher, and in all of this why would you do that? You're planting seeds in their mind of possibility. You're beginning to envision and helping them to envision what their future as a saint of God is going to look like. And that's important. Look forward to seeing you. Hope you can be here Wednesday. When you come in, I'd be so pleased if you came and sat by me and my family. Okay, now I've gone through what we do how we do it, and the why. The why is the driving engine in all of it. Nothing's wasted. So with the concept of continuous improvement, and I think needs to be in every church plan, needs to be in every church, we need to constantly be thinking about getting better with what we do and with how we do it. But the truth of the matter, it's unlikely that our why is ever going to change. That why is kind of the holy grail, so to speak. We'll change how we do some things. We'll change what we do. As long as we're getting better at those things, that's fine. But the why, you've got to get to your why. Now, I had a second part that I was going to do with this, but I'm not going to for the sake of time. Uh, it will be in the show notes that are immediately uh, that are going to be provided on Facebook and also on CarltonCoonSenior.com. Uh, it has been said the person who knows what to do almost always works for the person who knows why it is to be done. Why? Why do you have corporate prayer in the way you do? Why do you schedule graduation for your take root classes? Why would you welcome newcomers one Sunday of each month? Why do you why do you have the church schedule you have? Why would you hire a particular staff person as your first hire for the church? 
that this why business is important because it's critical thinking, and there's not much critical thinking that happens. We just we just cut the end off the roast because we saw it's what we we saw mom do the same thing. And so while your questions come in, I have uh, an opportunity to explore some tools. Three of my books are actually named How and Why. How and Why of New Convert Care, How and Why of Follow-Up Visitation, How and Why of Hospitality. And there are two great options for you today. All three of my How and Why books, including everything I discussed about the altar counselor, including job descriptions for that person, how to train them, uh, the script they're to go through, worksheet for them to fill out with the people. And of course, you're going to want to adapt all of this to your specific location and circumstances. Uh, job description for whoever's doing your follow-up visitation, whoever's helping with director of disciple making. Uh, all of these all of these books, digital books, $10 each, but uh, you can have them for the next week for $14.99. That's all three books, $14.99. No shipping, no waiting. You get them. You can copy as many of them as you want to use in your local church, hopefully only in your local church, um, to help train some of your other people to help you in various aspects of hospitality follow-up visitation, and also in discipleship. If you like hard copy in hand, that will also be on sale. It's $12 for the same length of time. The links of both will be available on screen uh, just under this posting of video. If you get any of this and you use it, I assure you that if you're like the pastor I spoke with this week who has baptized four since the first of the year, and they're so excited about the four, and it's a wonderful thing. If you baptize the four, I guarantee you the tools here will help you keep more of the four. If you baptize 50, this will help you keep more of the 50. And if you baptize 100, this will help you keep more of that 100. If you get it and you don't put any of it to work, it won't help you a bit. Everything I offer is guaranteed. So... CarltonCoonSenior.com is the website, the How and Why digital packet, over 50% discount available for this week only. Some questions bounced through while I was doing this on Facebook, and we had unfortunately had some technical problems with that. Let me attempt to answer the questions. Uh, number one, yes. Uh, the question was, uh, do we... Uh, is it okay to wait a week? I do not think it's okay to wait a week for altar counseling. Uh, we we need to do it now because you've given the devil a week to do his business between this person being converted. If you wait a week, my experience quite often you don't get a chance to ever do altar counseling because they're not back for the for the later experiences. Okay, the other things had to do more with product than they did with uh, with content. Uh, the Bible study, uh, what the Bible says, is something that I put together. I never was very successful with, with chart uh, teaching. Um, I have no idea why I struggled with that, but I did. So eventually I developed a topical study, a series of seven lessons that I teach to new converts, or not to new converts, teach to lost people. And uh, it has served me well. I published it a number of years ago along with uh, cassette tapes of me teaching it to someone, and then we had a second option that did not, did not have the cassette tapes. We are, we're uh, preparing to re-release that. It has not been available for now for 10 years, I guess. And uh, so I, I do appreciate the question and the answer. And, um, and so if, if, um, if you'll give me a little time, I guess is the right way, maybe by midsummer I can have that ready. I do have a concept in mind that I think will work to make it easy to uh, to be available. Uh, it's kind of an interesting footnote here that uh, this particular Bible study is one that the district superintendent, general superintendent of, of uh, South Africa for many years uh, chose to use and he was very high on it, had it translated into a number of languages over there. And so 
we'll see. We'll we'll be back with what the Bible says eventually. Also, uh, questions ask about the CD uh, on teaching people to to pray and teaching people about um, uh, about reading the Bible to gain benefit for themselves. Um, that's kind of an in-house deal. What I would encourage you to do is to, uh, I think I can send you my script if I can get my hand on it, and uh, you just develop your own script and uh, make it available. Um, if there are enough people who are interested in that as a tool to use my, my particular voice, um, I guess I could develop a generic one and, and make it available at some low cost. Um, the, the the third question of this emailed, why do you make a great deal about, big deal about welcoming new converts to Calvary? There, there are two factors in this for me. One is the arriving person. This person needs to see themselves as valued. They need to see themselves as valuable to me, valuable to the church. Okay, that's the first thing. The second factor is for the church. The church a revival church must come to expect new people regularly being converted and added to that church. And so we take the time to welcome them. We actually come by, give a right hand of fellowship. We greet them. We celebrate them. We're welcoming them to the body. And uh, we're expecting these new people to come in and get very involved in the work also uses a time to talk about mission statement, which we're still working on in our current pastorate, and we clarify who we are as a church. There's things we're not any good at, things we're not aspiring to be good at. Uh, I empower these folks in a number of areas of ministry, and I let them know that I expect them uh, to be involved in ministry as well. And uh, then the last question, and then any others that come in, I'll answer uh, on Facebook, or if it needs to be done by direct message or email, I'll do that. Uh, why so much influence from a pastoral perspective on influencing converts and focusing on converts? Now, I, I don't want to be misunderstood because I love everybody and I value uh, the people of God. I pastor a precious lady who is 92 years old. She and her husband planted the first uh, apostolic church in the city of Springfield. Um, Sister McCarthy has been serving God for 70 plus years. I, I would not discount her in any sense of the word. We have others that have served God for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Um, I value, I appreciate all of that. Um, The old saying is you can't teach uh, uh, an old dog new tricks. Well, personally, I don't think that's the case. Um, I'm no longer a young dog, and I'm still learning some new tricks, as are evidenced by me being here in this particular forum tonight. So I think that, that people can learn. I think that people of whatever stage, and uh, even Sister McCarthy uh, at times will say to me, you know, I've gained so much from what you've just what you just taught tonight. On the other hand, uh, there are there are others who are mature people. They've been around the church a long time. Who you can teach them about prayer from now until Jesus comes, and they're not going to get very far into your corporate prayer efforts. Uh, they'll pray when there's a crisis in their family, but as far as prayer that is spiritual warfare. A prayer that breaks the strongholds of the enemy is simply not going to happen. So in short, the why for me of focusing on disciple making with these new converts is that this is the shape of change. These new spiritual babies are not limited uh, by much of anything. They read the Bible, they believe it. They hear the pastor talk about prayer and they tend to want to say, where do I sign up? And uh, that's, that's a positive thing. Okay, other questions that come to me, I'll respond in other ways. Uh, let me reiterate the opportunity. My How and Why digital packet is available at over 50% discount at the link below. Uh, copy them as often as you want for your local church. 
use my follow up and discipleship letters as a base to create your own letters. Uh, use your terms, your language, vernacular that's comfortable to you, and then email them. You can set up using MailChimp. You don't have to be spending any money right now on your prospect email list. And then hard copies of the same books are discounted to $12. I guess I made a mistake all through this. Here are the books. This is the How and Why of New Convert Care, the How and Why of Visitor Follow-Up, and the similar book is The How and Why of Hospitality. I'm in your corner, particularly those of you that are planning churches or in churches that are below average. Average is a church of about 80. Uh, I, I, I want to encourage you, before you spend a lot of energy trying to get out there doing what and how, that you figure out why. Because if you'll figure out your why, It'll save you a lot of time and a lot of wasted energy and wasted money down the road. Oh, and, and by the way, calendar my next webinar. It's the last Tuesday in May. It's 7.30 Central Standard Time, and I'll see you then. God bless.